Welcome for those of you that are joining me this morning. We're going to explore what's in your backyard and we're going to start by exploring what's in my backyard. So I've got a few different things that you may have seen in your backyard, school, or local area. Some of the things you may have recognised and other things might be new to you. Let's have a little look of the things that are on the table with me today. Hmm. So some of these might be really familiar, like a feather. This one is from an owl, a cicada shell. But maybe something like this is a little bit different. You might not have seen before. We're going to discover what these are. Bird's nest. Other insect exoskeletons, so the skin that they shed. This one here is something you may have seen before as well. Most of these things I found in my lily pilly hedge in my front yard, which is a native plant. And in there, I have found these before. We'll have a closer look at what these are in a moment. This is quite a big one. Sometimes you find smaller ones, but they actually will grow. So we'll learn about that in a moment as well. And this one I've also found in that same lily pilly hedge. I found three or four of these. Let's have a closer look at some of the live things that you might see if you look closely and use great observations. So looking and listening. Hmm. See if we can focus. I wonder if you can see any animals that you think might be alive. Hmm, maybe you can call out at your computer to let me know how many you think are there. We've got one, two, and three. So these are all different species of stick insect. Let me zoom out a little bit so we can see them a bit clearer. So these are two different species, and sometimes you might see the animal hiding in a tree. They've got excellent camouflage, but sometimes you might only see these bits, the exoskeletons or the skin that they shed as they grow. And that could be the clue what you're looking for. Now, I know I've got another little friend in here. Let's see. Where's he gone? Is he hiding back in the tree? Oh, no, he's on my elbow. Let's put him in the plant there. Well, I don't think he wants to go in the plant, so let's zoom into my hand. So this one here is a small praying mantis that, again, I found in those plants. Green leaves, green praying mantis can be very, very hard to see. So this one is only a small species, it's full size. It'll often be hiding in those branches as well. And they disappear quite a lot. So sometimes you need to look really, really closely, but other times it might be animals that you hear. So I'm gonna share some slides with you of my backyard and some of the things that I heard um, this morning or some of the things that I found during um, the day. So let's have a look. So this is a picture of my backyard this morning. And I've spent a lot of time in the last couple of years planting um, lots of different types of plants that will attract different groups of animals. So I've also got something in the back here. This is an insect hotel. Now, a lot of the time my insect hotels like to um, become a home for the little garden skinks. And I've also got a frog hotel here as well. So this is for tree frogs that might not like living in a pond but I've also got lots of different types of plants that will help animals that are pollinators, which means they want to get the pollen, but also, it's very hard to see, but all around here, there are lots of spiders. So I often call this my spider garden because I've got lots of spider egg sacs and lots of different species of spiders living in that garden. And you never know what you might find. This was from my front yard this morning. 
and hiding in a beautiful bottle brush that had just started flowering, there was a very small spider. Now, if you guys have, have a look at your pinky fingernail, this spider was only about the size of your pinky fingernail. So sometimes you need to slow down and look and listen to discover some of these small things hiding in your garden. Now, we mentioned the cicada exoskeletons before. These are a really common thing that you might find in your backyard, especially as the weather is warming up. Coming up in the next few months, you'll start seeing these. But the other big sign that you've got cicadas around is the sound. They're one of the loudest insects in the world. This is one that's just emerged from its exoskeleton there. If you're very lucky and you're in the right place at the right time, you might also see one emerging from its shell or one drying its wings right near that exoskeleton. You've got to be lucky. Oh, we've got a little ant off to the side there as well. Now, I mentioned these before. This is a closer of a fresh one of these that I found about the size of a 20 cent piece. And it is, ready? A praying mantis egg sac. So the praying mantis actually lays this foamy egg sac with all of the eggs stuck inside. So I found these in my tree, which explains why I've got several different species of praying mantis that I've been seeing um, developing and growing and becoming adults at my house. So this little one here, again, looking at your pinky fingernail, guys, it's about the size of your pinky nail. They are super tiny when they first hatch out of those eggs. Now, guys, unfortunately, this particular one was when I was taking photos of my spider garden. I don't know if this one survived. I think this one may have become lunch for a baby spider. And this is that praying mantis I showed you before. Nice close up of his face there. Praying mantis, you can identify from that really clear triangular shaped head. Um, they are e excellent camouflage um, and they are great um, hunters as well. So hopefully, luckily, I know that the size of the praying mantis that's in with my stick insects is quite small. So I know that my stick insects are safe from this one. Now, I mentioned these before. Some of you may have seen them. And they are called case moths, sometimes called bag moths. And I love these guys when I find them because they actually make their own silk. And they chew off little bits of stick and stick it to the outside of their silk and they will grow and they'll just come out the top to eat. And this is one that I had with my stick insects for a while. And I love it. it. looks like he's wearing a little woolly jumper here. It's made out of the silk of that cocoon. So they emerge to chew. So you might notice little munch marks on leaves. And that's another clue that you have. Maybe caterpillars, maybe even a case moth, maybe stick insects around your area because there's little chew marks in the leaves. So sometimes you might not see the animal, but you'll see the evidence that they leave behind like those little munch marks. So this guy, he's coming out of his amazing little case um, to chew on some leaves and will hide back in and will close off the case, usually sticking on the bottom of a branch or a leaf until it's ready to come out for its next meal. Sometimes we might see things like this, very common around where I live in Sydney, are these curled leaves. Now, these are actually from a spider. The clue might be the spider web behind it. So instead of just having a web for protection, this particular type of spider also likes to make these curled leaves. So they get a leaf when it's green and they use their silk to stitch it up. And when it dries, it becomes a home, becomes a shelter. And these are called leaf curling spiders. And this is one in my backyard that I was able to get a photo right down the middle of the leaf. And what I was surprised to see was the abdomen, so the bottom of the spider there, so we can tell it from its, its pattern and its shape. And if you're very lucky, sometimes you might see the little spider coming out the bottom of the leaf. So what a great way these spiders creating extra shelter for themselves, extra protection from predators. And it's great to have these small spiders around because they're going to be eating mosquitoes and other types of flying insects that get trapped in their web. Now, this is not my backyard. This was one I found in my front yard a few years ago. 
It's a beautiful stripy but, um, caterpillar. And again, I could see the munch marks in the leaves from where it was eating. But over time, I kept a good watch. So sometimes if you see something, go back and visit it every day and maybe it will change or grow. This particular one formed a chrysalis or this kind of cocoon stuck on the underneath of the leaf right outside my front door. And the silver almost mirror reflect, reflection of this type of chrysalis was how I was able to identify it as an oleander butterfly cocoon. And I was waited and waited and waited. We can see that it's emerged from its chrysalis as an adult butterfly. And all these animals, like the cicadas, like the butterflies, they need to rest and dry their wings before they can fly away. So if you're very lucky and you've been very patient, you may also see the adult animal emerge from its cocoon or its chrysalis as a adult butterfly. And that's how I was able to get this great photo. I've actually got a video of it drying its wings. Mm, this is another one that you, you might not recognize because these live in the water. So many species of animal use a part of their life cycle is in the water and they go through what we call a metamorphosis and change and look very different from their young form in the water to their adult form. And so this one is a dragonfly. So this is the dragonfly nymph that you might find in a little pond or a creek. And this is the adult that you would see on, on land. Now, again, just drying its wings. Very, very lucky to capture this photo of this beautiful one in my backyard. And I had a great but, um, dragonfly season last summer. And I'm hoping to have another wonderful dragonfly season in my backyard again. There were so many different species and colours flying around, um, munching up all of those tiny flying insects. Now, sometimes we might not see an animal. This particular one, if you can spot it there, very well camouflaged in the garden bed, is a striped marsh frog. And sometimes it's the calls that help us identify them. Let's have a listen. Hmm. What an interesting talking sound. If I didn't know, that this was the call of a striped marsh frog, I would think it was maybe not a frog at all. So sometimes the sounds that we hear um, in our backyards, we don't recognize as the animals that they are. So let's have a listen to a couple more and we'll see what we can identify. Here's another type of frog here. This is the most common frog in my backyard and it's a Perrin's tree frog got these great little cross pupils and they have such a loud call um, and they're very, very common around Sydney. So one of the most commonly found frogs um, at the moment often is this Perrin's tree frog. And this is the green tree frog. Let's listen to his call. I always think that that's quite a classic frog sound, that croaking sound. Now, I was hoping that that sound might trigger my frog here to make some noise, but I don't think he's going to today. He's just going to look at himself in the camera. So he is a green tree frog. They're quite big. You can see next to my hand. Now, this one is my pet, so I can't take the credit for finding him in the backyard. I have had this frog for over 15 years and you do need a special license to keep um, frogs and reptiles as pets. So when you're older, you might be able to get one off a licensed breeder and keep some of these animals as pets. We can see he's showing his hands. He's got his four fingers on his hands. Is he gonna show us his feet? Oh, not really. They've got five toes. So a little bit different only having four fingers but what's great we can see those sticky pads on his fingers there to show that he's a tree frog that he likes to climb and he's got a big mouth there as well so sometimes you might be lucky to see one of these frogs hiding around your backyard but most of the time it's what they sound like 
And there's a great program called Frog ID that you can all get involved in. And it is about recording the calls of frogs. So if you hear a frog in your backyard, especially as the weather is warming up, the frogs are starting to call, maybe borrow mum and dad's smartphone, ask permission, and get them to download an app called Frog ID, and you can record those frogs. And those calls you can send to the Australian Museum and they will identify them for you. And they'll tell you what type of frog it was. So such a great way of becoming your, a scientist, a citizen scientist, and helping learn more about frogs in your backyard. So they're some of my favourite, but let's listen to some other animals that we might be hearing in our backyard. These are the grey-headed flying fox, and they're quite common around at the moment. I can hear them screeching and having little arguments in the trees um, around where I live. So they move from their colonies and they fly just as the sun's setting. So you might see the big black wings fly through the sky as they're moving to find food. So let's have a listen to what they might sound like. You might have heard this at night. They always sound like they're having, a, having a, a little bit of an argument. And at night, they're finding their food. These are fruit bats. You can see the beautiful big eyes, and they're actually using their sight and their, their smell to be able to find their food. And they are absolutely amazing um, animals to have around. This is another one that might be a little bit common that you might have heard before, which is the brush tail possums. They also sound a little bit like they're sort of hissing and arguing, but that could be one of the sounds you might hear in the tree near your house at night time, and you might not have known what it was. So it could have been either the grey-headed flying fox or the brush tail possums that are feeding around in your garden while you're asleep. Now, sometimes we might find some weird things like this. Hmm... I can see some little bits of bone in it and little bits of hair. It looks a little bit disgusting. Hmm, but I wonder what this could be from. Is it a clue that there is an anim a certain type of animal nearby? And yes, it is. These are our pellets. So otherwise known as our vomit. So lots of birds that are um, hunters and predators will can't digest all of the material that they eat. So they, things like little bits of bone, fur and feathers, they need to spit back up. Um, and so we find these things called our pellets. They're really super important for scientists to discover because it gives them information about what kinds of food these particular birds are eating. So that's really important. This one here is a powerful owl and they need these hollow logs and hollow trees um, to live in. So very lots of their habitat is disappearing. So it's really exciting if you hear one of these. Now I'm going to listen to the call. Every now and again, I hear a powerful owl. So definitely keep an ear out for this species. They are quite endangered and they're actually doing lots of research around Sydney um, and around further away about where these animals are living. So if you hear that sound, let someone know. It's really important. Now, this is one that's been waking up my kids um, every year. So it's not, I haven't heard it yet this year. Oopsie. Let's, let's have a listen. This is a coel. Some of you may recognise that sound. Some of your parents might know that sound as well. So in the next few months, we'll start having the coels come around and it can be something that wakes you up and yeah, it's hard to get back to sleep with that call. 
This is the owl that I have nearest me that I hear most of the time at night. This is a boobook owl, the southern boobook owl. And this is the one that I can hear in my backyard. And it's that real whoo-hoo kind of sound. So keep an ear out for this one as well. Now, the last one I'll show you, we'll listen to, is the tawny frogmouse. So these are not owls. These are in a group called night jars. They've got really big mouths that they use to catch their food. And they like to stay still and camouflage. So sometimes you can see them in the trees during the daytime and they will stay very still with their heads up sometimes um, with their family all together pretending to be a branch but if you listen at night time you might hear this call so a real repetitive Hoo, 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 hoo. If you've ever heard that before, it means that you've got the tawny frog mouse around. So next time you're walking around your backyard or local area, have a look up in the trees. You never know, you might be able to spot a tawny frog mouse. Sometimes the poo is the clue. Now this is one, certainly not from my backyard. This was actually when I was on a holiday and there were two clues that I discovered here. One is a burrow and two are these cube shaped poos. And some of you may know that there's only one Australian mammal that does square poos. And yes, you're right, it's a wombat. So the two clues were the square poos and that burrow. And this is our wombat here. So depending on where you live throughout Australia, you may have more bigger areas of bushland and you may have things like wombats living in your local area. And sometimes the poo is the clue. Now I love this particular photo here because it's all about animals that try to mimic. So it's not just camouflage. This particular spider is called a bird poo spider and it is camouflaging and pretending to look like bird poo. So let's have a little look. We can see some legs here but the rest, and there's the eyes at the top, but the rest of it does just look like a splat of bird poo. So sometimes nature is out there to trick you by camouflage or animals that mimic to look like a different species. And this is just a little bit of fun with the bird poo spider there. Now, some of the things that you can do to create a animal friendly garden might be to build a pond, but even if you don't have the space to build a pond, you can put out little dishes of water um, to help native wildlife in summer. So it might be that you are doing, um, it's been really hot and it's been a bit of a drought. You can pop different um, little containers of water to help with your wildlife. Or you could put a deeper container out, maybe with some sticks and some branches and rocks to make sure any animals that go in can get out again because lots of animals, even if they live near lots of water, can't always swim very well. So having lots of ways that animals can get out is important. This is a, that garden I was showing you before, um, well before all those other plants started to grow. And this is the frog hotel. Sometimes you can call them frog tubes. So big um, tubes with different diameters that you can put in the ground or put in a, a pot or a container to move around that can create a great habitat for the tree frogs. You can also add these tubes directly to the side of a tree or a branch to create another safe habitat for animals in your local wildlife, especially those tree frogs. And I've also made a lot of these insect hotels and I put them in different spots within my garden just to create small safe places for animals to explore. So there are so many different ways that you can explore your backyard and your local area by looking for these clues. And the best way to start is being quiet, going outside with, a, with an adult, letting an adult know that you're out in the backyard doing some exploring, sitting quietly and doing those scientific observations, the looking and the listening. So when I went, was outside this morning, getting ready for today, I was listening 
and I could hear lots of birds. And I knew because I've seen these birds as well that I was listening to lots of rainbow lorikeets screeching and moving around the bigger trees in my area, traveling around to find different um, plants that they'd like to um, get pollen and nectar from. I could also hear some sulfur crested cockatoos in the distance and the laughing kookaburra. I could hear the kookaburras getting ready for their calls as well. When I was very quiet, I could also hear some different buzzing noises of some different flying insects that were moving around. And when I used my eyes and I was looking, I could see some spider webs and some juvenile baby spiders in those webs. I could see some munch marks in the leaves that gave me clues that I've got different types of insects that are eating the plants. And I also saw different poos. So I knew that I had currawongs, a type of bird, because I had lots of big splattered poos with uh, lots of seeds in them. I also noticed that on my driveway, I had some bat poo. So the bats must have been flying around last night. And I did hear them as well um, in the trees. When I was inside last night, I could also hear the sound of the boobal cow and the Perrin's tree frog. So what you can do is follow up with some of the great resources on the Australian Environmental Education website and there's information sheets and activities that you can do to find out more of what is living in your very own backyard. You can also go on a nature walk in your local environment, either your local park or even just around some different bushland areas. And you may be lucky to see and hear even more. So write it down. What was the clue? What animal do you think it was? Even if it's as simple as, I found a feather, so I know that I've got birds around. And over time, you may be able to notice that their feathers are different. And you might even be able to start identifying what type of bird it was. So putting the clues together give you a whole lot of information to think about all of the different animals. So I know that I can hear booble cows. So most likely, when I know that this is a feather from an owl, that it's most likely the same, very similar colour pattern to a boobal cow. So putting the sounds and what I'm seeing together helps me understand more about what's going on in my local backyard. So guys, it's a beautiful time, school holidays. It's a great opportunity for you guys to get out there and do some exploring. Now, more than happy if you want to contact me through the Australian Environmental Education website. If you found something really exciting, um, you can send me a picture. If there's something you're not sure about, please feel free to contact me and maybe we can work together to help identify that as well. So I'm just going to finish off with sharing a link um, to the website and have fun exploring during school holidays. So thank you so much for joining me today. I look forward to hearing about all of your amazing adventures. See you later, everyone. Have a great day.